Hey Gaming Geek here with another how to play video. Before we go to that I just want to say click below in my Patreon link to see what the monthly raffle giveaway is for my Patreon supporters. Thanks to those of you who are supporting this channel you have an opportunity to win a monthly prize. Today we're going to be looking at the rules for Core Space. This is a game that I uh, kick-started and I have received everything and I really like this game a lot. Look at how cool this mat is and the terrain. I wanted to provide a video that just shows you the rules and how to play this awesome game. Uh, right off the bat I do want to say that if you did kickstart it rather than getting the core set there's a number of things that might be helpful for you to know. The first thing is when you're playing up to three players separate out the extra purge characters that you have because that's going to make a difference in what is spawned on the board and so you're just, I'm just going to be using um, two of these devastators, five harvesters, one assassin and one live one and so wait until you're a little bit more experienced or if you have more players before you add the second set that comes with the Kickstarter expansions. Also the deluxe rule book that comes with the advanced rules you don't really need that to start off playing the game the advanced rules are really if you're going to be adding more things uh, that's where the um, advanced rules are going to come into play but you don't need to have that if you're only getting the core set also you do not want to punch out the extra sheet of items as well as the ruler if you're only playing up to three characters because it dilutes what you're pulling from the bag only once you have playing up to six characters, four to six characters, will you want to punch that out. And honestly, I would stick the, these items into a separate bag so that you're pulling items from two bags because I think it makes it a little bit too hard when you mix everything in. Uh, it sort of dilutes out which items that you might be able to pull. So that's just my suggestion to you if you did get the Kickstarter version. So let's go ahead and dive into uh, the rules of how you play this game. Alright, so we're going to talk about setup first and there are a couple of good videos on YouTube from Battle Systems that will show you how to put all of the terrain together. And so I've set up the terrain uh, following the example mission briefing. This is on page 56 of the advanced rules 57. And let me go through some things that might be confusing for you uh, in setup. So the first thing that you want to do is after creating this, uh, and some people have asked, these dotted lines are basically doors as opposed to these white lines which are windows. And then this line here is the um, girder or whatever these things are called. I don't know what they're called. But so for example, that's a door there, that's a window, that's a door. So that's how you figure out uh, which ones to use. And then you're plotting all of the furniture on there as well. Um, this scenario starts off with a maximum starting crew of three, and so we have our three teams here from the original set. Um, and also, you want to set up your event cards, and how you do that is you look down here at the bottom corner, um, and the cards are uh, signified by these symbols. And so here it's saying get all of the NPC cards, get all of these world cards and then uh, take all of these harvester cards and shuffle them and then draw four of them and then that's how you create your deck to draw from. Uh, make sure you're following this for each scenario and then the hostility tracker here says we start off with three um, in the hostility tracker so we're going to grab um, three of these pegs, black pegs and stick them in there the game starts with that and at the first turn we're actually going to stick another one in there. Um, and then here, uh, some people are confused about what this means here, the rare items along the bottom. But basically what this diagram is saying is you're going to put one big, usually a rifle, into uh, each one of these long ones and then two small ones. So each of the big chests is going to have one long and two small ones. And the way that you're going to figure that out, it's a little bit complicated, is uh, since there are four of these long ones, you're going to have uh, four long treasures in there. But one of them is going to be a rare item and only one. So what you got to do is separate out your rare large items. And there's three of them that I've counted. And what you want to do is pull out three more uh, regular ones. And then just randomly just pick one 
and throw it in there with the other four and without knowing just stick them all in there, right? And then you do the same thing with the smaller items. You're going to have uh, four of the small chests and so that's going to be 12 items total. So draw out 11 of your regular items and then pick randomly one of these rare ones, throw it in there, mix it all up, and that's how you're going to randomize. Uh, you're going to have one rare item uh, each. I think that takes too long for setup, and so all I do is I throw everything, uh, the small bits, everything in the bag, and if basically whoever draws the first rare item uh, keeps that, and then any other rare items that might show up in the game is uh, basically discarded and you draw randomly from the bag uh, until you get a regular item. So I think that's way faster to do that than to every game uh, pull these out and create a pool and you're trying not to look at it while you're throwing them in. So I think that's a lot easier. I do the same thing uh, with these. I just throw them all in a bag and without looking I draw um, a random one out when I'm filling up these chests. And then uh, finally you have a key item and in this scenario the key item is this objective token which will give you three UA uh, that's basically the currency of the game and it tells you to uh, pull out the three value objective and the objective the secondary objective of this scenario is to go ahead and spend an action to interact with this console and you're able to pull um, the plans or the shipping schedule and that will give you bonuses for the next round. The primary objective is basically this is a, a treasure hunt where you're trying to open as many chests as possible because you want to equip your guys. And that's the other thing about this um, that was confusing for me that I had to ask a question about. Here it says in selecting a crew, and this is page 66, um, when you're first selecting a crew and you're going to have a campaign, it says here, rookie crews do not start with any career advancements. That just means you're not going to be beyond your starting um, career points. And so for Ariana here, she will have four career points. And I just picked, if you're playing this for the first time, just pick randomly. Seriously, just, it doesn't really matter. Uh, until you get to know the skills, you really won't know what to pick. And so when you're starting a campaign, we just ruled it that once we get to know the game, we can change and switch up these dots as we like it. Um, these other two um, scrubs, they only have one skill point, so just allocate it accordingly. But that's all this means, is that uh, it doesn't mean you don't start with any career uh, points. It's just you're not going to get any bonus advancements at the start of the game. Also, you are allowed, each trader is allowed to have a zero value close combat weapon, a zero value shooting weapon, which could be either a rifle or a pistol, and uh, a two health stim pack, a medi stim. And the thing about this is there isn't enough tokens to outfit two teams of six. And so some characters just aren't going to have a weapon. So Gak here uh, has no weapons starting out. Whereas Ariana here has a pistol and a knife. Now there are enough medistims for everyone to have a medistim. But it says here there's a maximum of two medistims per crew. So you can only equip your team with two of them total. And so I was worried about that, but the honest truth of the matter is, is you're gonna find enough weapons pretty early on in the game that you don't really have to worry. And most of these starting items are pretty useless. I mean, this is, you're rolling one die for crying out loud, um, which is really hard to do any damage uh, to the purge because they have shield. So that's pretty much the setup for the game. Um, I did buy an extra di dice pack, and so each one of my players does have their own dice. Also for setup, you're going to be adding these NPCs on these spots, so it really doesn't matter. The game starts out with three NPCs. Expansions will give you more, but go ahead and stick these guys onto the board according to the map. And there's a cool AI system that will pl um, move them around as you go along. Um, and then also you place your ship, your docking ship, along any of these areas. So it's basically the four corners of the map. And so this team, Ariana's team, is going to start over here. Jace's team is going to start over in that corner, sort of opposite corners to one another. 
All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at these character dashboards. So each one of these guys are trader, and you can have one captain. In fact, you need to have one of your traders be captain, and they are the most powerful. So Ariana here is the captain uh, of this ship, and she has a special ability that enables her to move one extra inch uh, in addition to the normal four inches for a move action. Uh, Gak here has this ability, which I have to look up on my chart here, uh, this uh, level one ability is used when making a close assault attack, add two dice to use the attack. So that's a special ability, but he only has two uh, ability pegs to pull. Roy Kirk uh, has this Fox special ability, which I think is a persuade. Uh, you can make a persuade action against an enemy trader and within a short range of line of sight to try to dissuade them from their mission, they miss their next turn, basically. So he can try to do that. Also, if you look here, there are uh, small black circles within uh, these colored circles, and that is your starting abilities. So Ariana here has five health, uh, two actions, four skills, and four career points to spend. And so again, I almost randomly picked these four and then put the corresponding pegs here for health, skills, and then her uh, ammo. Ammo is always filled out to the max for everybody. That's their starting ammo. You do really need to print out these cheat sheets. Um, unfortunately, this one doesn't have the mag skills, which I don't think the base set really uses, so I don't think it matters. So this here is the hostility tracker, and as the game moves along, more and more of the purge and other enemies are gonna be spawned. And so you start off here in the relax, at least in this scenario, and once you go into the guarded, uh, you're gonna be rolling to see how many harvesters are spawned each round. And then that will increase to include uh, devastators, uh, once you get in, watch your back, and then cover me, you start spawning all kinds of craziness here. Uh, and it's two automatically our harvesters are spawned and then you roll the dice randomly to see how many devastators uh, Assassins and so on and so forth. So go ahead and pick who's going to be first player And so this is the first player token. We're going to have Ariana's crew go first and The very first uh, phase is the hostility phase and what you do here is you go ahead and grab a black peg and add it to the hostility track. And then you draw an event card. So let's see what our first event card is. And these are separated out by which hostility phase you are in. So from relaxed to guarded, it says moon boots. The artificial gravity is acting oddly. All movement distances are increased by two this round. Oh, that's great. Uh, so movement for a move action, normally you go four inches and this will enable everyone to go six inches which is great for a first round. So we'll go ahead and set that aside. That is the end of the hostility phase. Now it is a trader phase where traders will take turns activating their units. And so here, if you notice on the ship, this is the hatch where you can go out. It isn't this whole edge. So characters have to go out. So when you place them, make sure the first character that you wanna go first, activate first, is there. Every trader has two actions that they can use and there's multiple things that they can do. So one of the most common ones and obviously what you're gonna do first round is you're gonna move. And when you look at this movement ruler, a regular move is four inches. Again, we're gonna get uh, six inches now because of the gravity unwell event card that we drew. And then Ariana is gonna add one more on top of that. So she's gonna be moving seven inches uh, for one movement action. You can do two movement actions per round, but you are limited by going max move of 11. So even though technically she could do two move actions for 14, any max movement that you can do is only up to 11. The other thing that's really important to know is in addition to two actions, you're gonna get something called an effortless action. And an effortless action, this is really handy, and I, I like this mechanic in this game, where most of the time you're gonna use the effortless action of moving one inch. So let's say um, I was gonna go up and try to uh, get up to that crate. And let's say uh, she moved, she did a double move and only got to here, which means uh, when she wants to do a search action, she would have to waste a movement action to close in the gap and touch it with her base before she can search. 
But what um, an effortless action does is it allows you to move one inch after doing a regular uh, move action or even you might shoot twice, which is two actions, and you can still move one inch uh, as an effortless action. Other effortless actions are use any item that has a check mark. So this uh, medi stem, it only takes an effortless action to um, gain two health and use the medi stem. You only get one effortless action, so you can't nudge um, one inch movement and also take a health uh, medi stem. So you have to pick one or the other each round. You can also throw items uh, as an effortless action. You can pick up or drop items and you can give, take, or swap items with one other character that you're in base-to-base -base, uh, contact with. So those are effortless actions which uh, I really like as a mechanic. But she's gonna go ahead at, with her turn and she is gonna move twice. So for her first move, and it is uh, regular movement, sort of base, uh, out four inches, and in this case, it's gonna be seven. So she's gonna end up all the way over here. So that's not close enough. And then she's gonna do a second action, but it's only gonna take um, three inches, so she's not gonna do her max movement, although I will be on this side uh, of the crate. And then next turn, she's gonna be able to search and open that. And that is another action, is to search, and you have to be touching uh, base to the object in order to search. So I'm gonna go ahead and put an activation marker onto Ariana because she used both of her. Now she didn't end up using an effortless action because I got her where I had plenty of movement to get her where she needed to go. Jace's team. And again, I put Jace right in the front. So he also is gonna be doing a move action. And so Jace is, um, actually he's gonna be heading for the middle uh, to try to gain that first objective. And so he's gonna be able to move um, two additional inches, which is six. And then he's gonna move his max, which is 12. Now you do have to move around objects. You do have to move around people. Uh, one thing I don't know is if you can move through friendlies. I don't think so. Uh, but uh, for sure you can't move through NPCs or enemies because one of the other actions you can do is called knockback. So knockback basically says that you roll dice equal to your character's unarmed combat value. And if they don't have an unarmed combat value, uh, they roll one die. So for example, Gak here has an unarmed combat value of two. Uh, that's why I didn't equip him with a knife because a knife is actually worse, you only roll one. So he would be rolling two dice if he's knocking back someone. And then Ariana or... Um, Roy Kirk, who does not have an unarmed combat value, they would just be rolling one die. And here's the thing about rolling dice in this game, you always will roll the blue dice. Any additional dice that you roll are red dice. And so if I had a gun that used uh, three dice, I would always roll a blue and then add two more red to that. Uh, and so that's how it works. So in circumstances over here, Let's say for whatever reason, this NPC was blocking the way or for Jace to move through. Let's say something was blocking here and he had to squeeze her and he couldn't go around. Basically, he can use an action to try to knock him back. And the way that you do that is um, Jace does not have an unarmed value. So he's just gonna be rolling one die. And so he got a success. And for each success that you get, you knock back an inch. And so, he moves back this way uh, an inch, and Jace can choose to follow up if he wants, but he doesn't want to because he just wants to go around him. If I roll uh, three successes, let's say he was rolling two dice and rolled three successes, um, he is knocked back three inches, but then falls over, is knocked down, uh, which has some added benefits because they have to waste an action standing back up during their turn. If, though, you attempt a knockback and you don't roll, uh, but you roll any uh, hazard signs, it means you you fail and they immediately are able to make a knockback roll against you. And so they would take the blue die, how, whatever their unarmed combat level is. And then in this case, he would have successfully pushed him back one inch. But Jace is going to be doing his maximum movement, which would be um, a double move of 12. But again, your maximum is 11. He can't do his maximum of 11 inches and then use an effortless action to go one more inch uh, because that would be going beyond his maximum. So he's just gonna go 11 inches, which will place him all the way, moving around these obstacles, all the way over here. 
And so Jace is done. So typically the first round people are, are just moving. We're gonna go back over here and see uh, what Gak is gonna do. Uh, he needs equipment. And so I think he's gonna try to go after this crate, supply crate there. And so he also is gonna do his max movement, which again is going to be 11. And he has to go through this door. There's no door against this wall. Here is five inches to this door. And then 11 actually enables him to touch, be in base contact with this chest. And so next turn, uh, he'll be able to search it. So we'll go ahead and put activation there. Lars is gonna go next, and I'm gonna have Lars go search out this crate. He definitely has range to get there for a double move. So he's just gonna double move there, and again, next turn, uh, search. Here to Roy Kirk. Uh, he is, I think, going to head over to there. And so his maximum movement is going to put him pretty close to uh, actually going to put him over here because he doesn't want to waste an action to knock her back. So he's going to navigate around her. So that's that character. And the last character, Renton, uh, he's going to uh, max move as well. I think he's going to go after that crate over there. Um, he has to navigate around this, and so 11 will put him right up to this door here. So they're going to have to wait. You are able to dive through windows, um, but for the most part, more bad things can happen to you than good. And so you only want to do that when you're running away from purge, you're about to die or something like that. It's a pretty desperate move, and so we're just going to uh, cont uh, use doors right now because there's no purge on the board to threaten. Now that um, all of the traders have gone, it is now the purge phase. And so when we look over here, we see in the relax phase, no purge spawn. So we're gonna skip that and go on to the NPC phase. We have three NPC and you take the white die and you roll it to see what happens. So we're gonna go ahead and roll. Oh, this is nice. So what this means is that she is going to go to the closest trader, which is right here next to her, Roy Kirk. And she's going to offer to trade. And so you go ahead and draw randomly from the bag. And this is the item she has, which isn't great. It's only, it's, it's not, it's a one zero uh, item. Oh, and really quick, th this number here to the left is how much you can buy the item for, one UA. Um, and the item to the right is how much you can sell it for. So it's pretty much worthless. Uh, so... But let's see, Roy Kirk actually doesn't have any item uh, that he wants to trade with her, and so uh, she's just gonna keep that. It goes into our item slot. They can only hold one item uh, as NPCs, and so that item is pretty much useless. Next, we're gonna go, go ahead and roll for Ganik. Uh, and this just means that he's gonna make a move, so four inches, um, although let's see, does this work with Yes, all movement distances, so even NPCs are gonna move two extra, so that turns into a six, a movement of six. And you look at the arrow and that's the direction that they go. So don't touch the dice after you roll it. He's gonna move basically diagonally um, the six inches. And what you're gonna see is he's able to move through the wall uh, and then it's gonna hit at uh, four inches, basically four and a half. Um, but he's going to continue to try to get into this space. So basically, after his four inch move here, he's going to turn uh, and go um, two more inches towards this door. Because ultimately, he's trying to uh, move this space. So you're moving around obstacles in order to get there. So that ends his movement. And then finally, we have Butler up there. Let's see what he does. Uh, he wants to join a crew. So basically, he moves to the closest trader in short range and line of sight, right? And he's in line of sight of Renton. He is within short range and we're using the range ruler for shooting here and he definitely is within short range. So he's gonna come up here and basically join this crew. So now what you do is you take his card, Butler, and he's going to function uh, and activate just like one of your guys. Now you don't turn him over, 
Um, he still has all of the same stats as this, it's just that you're controlling him right now. So he joins your crew and he's going to activate during the trader phase from this point on. There is a chance that he will stop uh, being a part of your crew if you do happen, you still roll this die for him during the NPC phase and if you roll this again, then he leaves your crew. But uh, this is handy because they're able to pick up items and carry it for you back to your ship. The final phase is the assessment phase where you pretty much look at the wind conditions, whether or not they are met, and you also remove tokens. Any condition tokens or markers uh, that go out of effect, you remove those uh, to get ready for the next round.